Hi, and welcome back to another episode of the Big DK Energy Podcast. My name is Danny Carenter, or the DK in the Big DK Energy. And growing up, I was a classic rock kid. And even though that some people think it is figuratively dead, the guest across from me today is one of the last bastions keeping it alive. Growing up in South Florida and having attended the University of Central Florida, he's now attending a residency for, to becoming a therapist, but when he's not rocking people's lives and making them for the better, he's rocking people's lives musically as this lead singer of the band Leaving Haven, which is based out of Central Florida. So I've known this guy for a while and he is awesome. You will love him as much as I do by the end of the episode. So with that all being said and done, please put your hands together for today's guest, Mr. Kent Lefebvre. How's it going, man? Going great. How are you, Kent? Doing great. Excellent. Thanks for joining the show. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, so Kent and I have actually known each other for a while now. I would say since 2014? Yeah. I mean, I actually think I met you in 2013 at the ZBT Lake party one time. That's right. And then yeah. I think the year after, it's that's when, I, yeah, when you rushed. Here. So yeah. Ken and I were fraternity brothers, and we would also hang out down south whenever school is out. And so one thing that Kent is mostly known for in our fraternity is being one of the last few bastions of rock for anyone that we know. <laughs> and dude, I just want to say, as someone, who, like I said, who just who grew up on classic rock, I just want to say I appreciate people like you. It's like... You're kind of our own localized David Grohl. <laughs> I mean, I, I really appreciate it, man. I definitely don't put myself anywhere near the same places. David Grohl, but, uh, you know, we got to keep rock alive. I, I love it, man. And it's just, I mean, of course, I know music evolves over time. And, you know, we started out with a lute or a mandolin and then eventually became an electric guitar or yeah. an axe in mm -hmm. the metal community, as they call it. Yeah. Metal. Just kidding. <laughs> So tell me, you are a singer of your own band, which is, I'm pretty sure every young boy in 2000s dream was to become a leader of a band or a singer of a band. So tell us a little bit about your musical journey. Yeah, well, I mean, I grew up always like just loving music. You know, my dad got me into classic rock, Pink Floyd, Leonard Skinner, Blue Oyster Cult, Rolling Stones, things like that. And um, I've always kind of been singing since I was a kid and never really trained, but you know, my mom was always saying things like, oh, you know, you got to join a, a band sometime when you're older. And uh, I didn't really believe that that would be the case. You know, it's kind of seemed like a bit of a pipe dream. But when I moved up to Orlando, that's when the kind of all the possibilities opened up for me. So I mean, South Florida, as I'm sure you know, it's really not a music hub, so to speak, especially when it comes to like rock and metal and things like that. There aren't a lot of people around our age doing that, those kinds of things. So. Absolutely. Everyone's more into the SoundCloud rapping or I don't know, some kind of hip hopping or, or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, which which is fine, but it it's, wasn't really my style, you know. Finally, when I moved up here to Orlando, I was actually looking for a guitar teacher because I was trying to get back working on my chops and stuff like that. And uh, I found some, you know, 19 year old kid who's amazing guitarist. I forgot where he may be in St. Pete now. His name's Vince. He ended up teaching me some music theory and stuff like that. And then he was telling me that he was looking for the vocalist for his band. He's trying to do kind of like a Slayer type of band. <laughs> and uh, that was also my nickname in ZBT. But um, <laughs> but uh, it was a great time. So, I mean, I, I was talking to him and I was like, hey man, you know, I'll just I'll try out and see what it's all about, you know? So I think I sang, I forgot if it was Raining Blood or... Yeah, I may have, I think, I think, it, may have, I think it may have been Raining Blood, but I, I tried that and he's like, yeah, man, you are exactly what we're looking for. We'd love to have you. So I was like, sure. So, wow, and you had no vocal training prior to that whatsoever? No, no, no. And, and I wasn't really used to screaming that type of way because it's more like a yell when it comes with like Slayer and, and other types of bands like that. It's, it's more of a yell rather than a scream. I know it can kind of sometimes be difficult to differentiate, but... What is the difference? Well, like the screaming that I do is kind of like vocal fries. So where like the vocal folds kind of like flap. They're like really close to one another and they kind of vibrate mm -hmm. and it, it kind of causes that type of sound. Um, and then there's also kind of like death growls and stuff like that, which I used to do back in my teens when I was listening to more, you know, death core and stuff like that. I don't know. I, I find that it's more tiring, a lot more fatigue when it comes to, to yelling a little bit. It's kind of hard to, to articulate exactly the difference between them. Um, but with yelling, I found myself a lot more fatigued. It isn't like, a, like I said, like the vocal folds aren't like super close in that regard. It's a, it's a little bit different. I feel like um, it would require a lot more breath maybe or something like that. Cause yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I enjoyed it. I was only in it for a couple of months, but, um, after our first show, we played at the Haven, which basically was just my friends and then some, some old people at the bar. So um, nice. it wasn't too many people, but. 
you know, afterwards I was like tasting blood in my throat and I was like, this probably, <laughs> this probably isn't good for me. Like, I mean, it's metal, but you know, yeah, it is, I also it's have like, metal, you know, but I also have a, a clean voice that I'm trying to preserve and this probably isn't going to be uh, sustainable for me, you know, unless I learn some different type of technique and, you know, I like Slayer and, and other thrash metal bands and stuff, but it wasn't really the style I wanted to do. It was kind of just like, I tried it out and ended up not really being for me. Was it a little heavier than you wanted it to be? Yeah, because it was all screaming. And uh, I like to mix kind of singing and screaming. Uh, more singing, for sure. Okay, so um, much like any band that you would see at Warped Tour, for example. Yeah, so more metalcore, post-hardcore bands. So um, what exactly does the core mean whenever it's the suffix to any kind of music genre? So it's kind of like, well, hardcore is like a form of punk, hardcore oh. punk. Okay. You know, so uh, bands like Barrier Dead and terror or expire things like that like there's some some other old school hardcore bands who else throw down hate breed those are like hardcore bands so like bands like some, some hardcore names yeah yeah so things like that and then metalcore kind of has like more breakdowns also some it's like different types of screaming sometimes too so like a little bit more of like those vocal fry rather than like yelling as much so is the vocal fry like for example uh what's a band that would have done it kellen quinn mm-hmm. he was part of Something in Sirens? Uh, Sleeping with Sirens. Sleeping with Sirens, that's right. And um, what he does, is that considered screaming or is that considered yelling? Yeah, I I never really listened to too much Sleeping with Sirens, but I would say it's it's more like vocal fry, I would say. So bands like Bullet For My Valentine, Trivium, you know. (laughs) Gotta do the shout out. Yeah, there's a bunch of bands out there. Get Scared, uh, Silverstein, those are a little bit more post-hardcore. Too Close to Touch. Like of, of mice and men, kind of of mice and men. Yeah, that was a, that's a vocal fry. Got so it's it. almost like when you think of like like a, a popular girl is kind of just like uh you know like oh my god yeah that's that's a vocal fry. Oh, but it's just projected more. So like the vocal folds are kind of vibrating against each other. You know they're very close to one another. So it's kind of just like that uh kind of thing. And then you you learn to kind of project that more. Hmm. Little tips about music I never knew. Yeah. Whereas like death growls are more like a false chord thing. So it's a different part of your voice that you're using. Okay. Because when I listened to a little bit of that music back you know, back in middle and high school, I used to sing yeah. in my car, but then I realized I would scream using my throat, but then it would get really scratchy. Is there a way that singers on stage manage to do that without ruining their throat? Yeah. Something? Well, there's definitely some techniques you can do. It took me a long time to learn how to how to vocal fry. I kind of learned from Matt Heafy of Trivium. I was always trying to kind of emulate him. You know, he's one of my role models. Um, I didn't really know how to do it in his kind of way. I, I used to know a different way how to do vocal fry that didn't hurt at all. Hmm. But for some reason, I like grew out of it. I don't know what happened if it was just puberty or whatever. But I used to be able to do it in a completely different way that didn't hurt at all. And now I can only do it on very, very few occasions when I have like more as gross as it sounds like more phlegm in the back of my throat. For some reason, I can kind of hit those notes from that old technique but um now it's more like i have to do a different type of fry vocal fry which is like the way that most metalcore or post-hardcore vocalists kind of do things and so to kind of go back to your question when it comes to you know warming up and stuff like that yeah there's absolutely different things you can do there's actually this dvd that i've been wanting to get called the zen of screaming by melissa cross wait dvd are there even any dvd players left yeah i don't know well i mean it was it was on a dvd i don't know if they may have it online now but her name is melissa cross she's like a vocal coach and all this stuff and she kind of learned the way how to properly scream without hurting your throat. And I also learned from a different video, some other guy, Chris Lipe, he's on YouTube and he was kind of talking about how to scream in a proper way. It's almost like you use like the, the break in your voice, you know, when your voice cracks, almost like you're like, a, you know, still prepubescent where you're kind of just like, ah, ah, that happened you know? at my bar mitzvah. Yeah, so exactly. So like using that kind of break in your voice, almost like a yodel and mm-hmm. kind of using that break to then push into the scream, into the vocal fry where it's kind of more safe. And I've been doing that and I haven't been noticing as much soreness and anything like that. So things like that. I also do some runs, you know, like right before I go on stage, I'll practice some vocal fries and stuff like that just to get ready. So that's really awesome. And I love learning like this kind of stuff that you wouldn't hear about from like a normal YouTube video. You get it straight from the source. I love it. Yeah. So things like that, definitely drink lots of water. I do actually do some stuff with like my neck here where you can kind of pop it out of the vertebrae a little bit. Oh, yeah, but it's kind of actually, it sounds kind of gross and it feels weird, but it actually 
stretches all the muscles there as well so things like that and then um don't you use some kind of machine to also like humidify your throat as well yeah yeah, yeah. it's a humidifier and i kind of breathe in the steam and it actually hydrates like the vocal cords and everything it's actually one of the best things you can do as it kind of goes right to the source of hydrating everything as opposed to drinking water and kind of waiting for everything to kind of circulate so i love that that's yeah. so awesome would you say that nathan explosion of metalocalypse has a vocal fry Nathan Explosion. Dude, it's been so long since I've watched Metalocalypse. <laughs> but uh, is Nathan, is he the uh, the, he's the singer. Yeah, yeah. So if I'm correct, he's played by Corpse Grinder for Cannib- from Cannibal Corpse. I, th- or, I, I, I th- thought he was. I don't know if it, he was played by him, but I know he was definitely based on him. Oh, okay. Death Clock and stuff like that is more Death, death Clock, metal. that's the name of the band. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. And that's, that's definitely more, I would say, false chords. Got it. So it's a different type of screaming. Hmm. You want to know something fun about you and him? What's up? You're both frontman of bands who are from Florida. Yeah, that's that's how it is, man. That's that's crazy, dude. Yeah, I haven't watched Metalocalypse in forever. <laughs> man, do you remember how brutal that show was? Yeah, yeah. With what was it Pickles, <laughs> the drummer? Yeah. And then um, he had his lisp. Uh, no, I think that was Murder Face, the bassist. You know the one that talks like this. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's him. Wait, but I want no crust on my bread too. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, that was, that was an awesome show, man. So speaking of um, bands and living the touring life, how many tours have has Leaving Haven done? So I've never personally been on a tour with Leaving Haven as much as I've wanted to. I think they maybe only had one like East Coast tour back mm-hmm. in 2013, 2014, maybe, maybe, maybe 2012 when their, their album released. Um, but they only did one tour and everything else has kind of been more within the Florida area. So we're hoping at some point that we can do another tour coming up, but we have more music that we got to release first. Understandable. Where has the coolest show been that you have performed with Leaving Haven then? My favorite show by far was at the Hard Rock Live at, um, at House, Universal. At the House of Blues? No, not, not House of Blues. The oh. Hard Rock Live. It's, oh, at, it's at Universal. You're right. Sorry, my bad. No, you're good. Actually, um, I do freelance photography, and I actually did one of your shows at, you did. at the House of Blues. You did. I remember that. I actually still have some of those photos. But, um, it was you a good did, time. You, you, did a, you did a great job, man. But, I appreciate um, it. Yeah, so we uh, we played the Hard Rock Live, I think it was May of 2018 or something like that. It was, it was around that time, and we opened for Theory of a Dead Man. Hmm. And that was that was a lot of fun. So we played maybe in front of like 1,500 people. Oh, wow. So it wasn't, wasn't too bad. It was a pretty decent show up, and I mean, just like the acoustics were amazing, you know, and you know, you kind of went downstairs and behind the scenes, you know, backstage, and you have to like take an elevator to go downstairs, and then there's like this whole hallway with just all these other pictures of like all these famous artists who have been there and stuff. I mean, they actually have it upstairs, like for everyone else to see as well, but it was kind of cool to see it like in this hallway, and then we had, you know, our dressing room and all that kind of stuff, so it was, it was a good time. It was a really good time, and like I said, it was the acoustics were amazing. You know, the, the crowd was pretty engaged. So, I mean, for some people, fifteen hundred might be like, oh, that's not a lot. But then, you know, some people can't even perform in front of one person. So, kudos to you for following your dream and still pushing through. Yeah, and, I appreciate um, it, Because I'm pretty sure those fifteen hundred people still rocked out with you, and so yeah, especially when we uh, we played "Forever" by Papa Roach. <laughs> uh, which is like I, I love that song so and it, you know the crowd was was very engaged with that so it was it was cool to have people sing along with that and feel like they were kind of involved with the music and we weren't just some like random local band that no one really gave a crap about listening to and it's still it's still fun when you can still have fun at those kind of events yeah I mean it's just that you guys are musicians you've taken a good chunk of your life to create something that humans absolutely love and can bond over, which is one of the few universal things that humans can bond over. It's crazy, man. Yeah. And it's like, you know, sometimes too, it's just with music, especially when it comes to lyrics and stuff like that, is people can perceive it differently. You know, unless you're very literal with your words, there's so many ways that people can kind of interpret your songs and what they mean. And that's kind of the beauty of of music and art in general. What are the topics that Leaving Haven loves to sing about the most? Well, at least with me in it, I've definitely been kind of talking some about like mental health awareness and stuff like that. And, and your song Silver um, Lining talks about that, if I remember yeah, correctly. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's more specifically about like ruminating, overthinking things and, and dwelling in the past and how that can get you really stuck, hmm. you know, and not being able to move past your mistakes and stuff like that. And, and always kind of dwelling and beating yourself up over things like that and how that can really just be a downward spiral 
well, I need to listen to that song because that describes a good amount of my life. Yeah. So it's kind of like, you know, the, the whole idea of like the silver lining is like taking the lesson out of those mistakes and, and moving past that. Using those lessons and those tokens of information to kind of be like, okay, like I may have made a mistake, but this is a valuable lesson and I can move on with my life. And You're this, allowed to redeem yourself. You're allowed to redeem yourself. Like that one, you know, thing doesn't define you and, yeah. and being able to take that lesson uh, so you can grow and you don't make the same mistake again and kind of see it from there because if you didn't make that mistake you would have never learned the lesson and therefore you would have never grown it's battle scars throughout life but we all get them and my dad was in the army so they have this thing and it's called embrace the suck and it's yeah. exactly how it sounds and also another thing that i've kind of learned not parallel but related to that is that you're not going to win all the time in life and yeah. just because some people has it more successful than you do does not mean that they win all the time because it's literally impossible to win all the time. No, no. You know, and progress isn't linear. There's going to be a bunch of roadblocks and bumps along the road, but there's definitely things that you can do to move past that rather than just crumbling in defeat. There's always another way to, to get past your obstacles. So it's kind of the way I see it. I, li I like what you're talking about with your dad too about embrace the suck. It actually kind of sounds very like almost Buddhist or stoic you know, so to speak. It ironically comes from a military setting, but then again, yeah. that's where a lot of those principles like to take place. It's also something that he taught, told me about, for example, when I got fired from my job due to COVID, you mm -hmm. know, and had to get back to work. It's just that, you know, I wasn't going to find anything, you know, glamorous, but I had to keep the lights on somehow. So therefore I got some kind of part-time job just to keep the lights on. And even though it sucked, it did what I needed it to do. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's important to take that into consideration. Like things are going to suck and there's going to be emotions associated with that. I guess it's more of like when he's talking about embracing it is rather than resisting what already is and that there's going to, that's going to happen. It's kind of going with the flow, so to speak. Yeah. Wanting your old life back isn't going to make it reappear quicker. Correct. Unfortunately. Correct. So kind of just accepting what is, but doesn't mean that you just settle for it, but you accept what currently is. And then you kind of take the steps moving forward to to change your life circumstances. The situation may suck, but you don't suck, if that makes sense. Correct. That's Correct. what I've learned, at least. Correct, for sure. So, yeah, I mean, you know, going back to, like, the lyrics and stuff like that, it, it kind of revolves around some mental health, a lot of triumph. Uh, I feel like a lot of, like, my lyrics tend to take, like, a positive spin on things and, and stuff like that. So, I mean, that song was more about what we talked about previously. Um, and we released Enemy. That's more about kind of, like, the, the political sphere so to speak and how divisive things are and kind of being able to get back to that place of empathy where we can at least understand where someone else is coming from don't necessarily have to agree but can at least put yourself in somebody else's shoes because at the end of the day we all come from different walks of life we all have our beliefs for a reason so rather than telling somebody that they can't believe that or that they're wrong is understanding that you know we all come from different places and we all have our, our beliefs for reasons and if we can at least put ourselves in the other person's shoe to understand why they may have that you know that can that can really help in terms of relieving some of that tension that we have currently in, in the climate and the political climate and that you know we aren't the enemy it's usually the people higher up mm -hmm. in media and, and the government and things like that and how they're the ones that are kind of pulling our strings and, and manipulating and stuff and that we have a lot more in common than we may think we do absolutely it's because it's like what you watch on tv everyone gets scared but then when you walk out into the real world everyone's like oh my god i saw the same thing it's like how do you feel about it i don't know i'm chill i don't know me too and i don't know it's just that everyone's going through a rough patch right now and there's just so much information that i can see why a lot of people are getting stressed out about what to believe and what not to believe you know what i mean correct because everything is is extremely biased so it's it's easy to kind of push that agenda and manipulate people into believing that there's you know only one side of the story when there's usually a lot more that's behind the scenes going on. This it reminds me of one of my favorite sayings, which is there's your side, my side, and then there's the truth. Correct. 100%. It goes back to what you said, different beliefs. It even can happen in one situation where one person thought, oh, I was in the right. No, I was in the right. And then when someone sees it from a third party view, they can kind of see what happened more than what happened first hand correct you know i just think it's something to take into consideration that's and that's what the really the song is really about that like we aren't the enemy we have a lot more common than we think and you know there's a lot going on on the higher ups that are making us believe that we have a lot more indifference than what we have in common and so there's that and been talking about some other stuff heartbreak one song that i'm actually working on right now is about bullying oh, so awesome and so that one's a, definitely a little bit more aggressive but that should be a fun one to release soon. And uh, we actually just recorded an acoustic song, my first ever acoustic song by myself, doing the guitars and stuff like that. So our bassist, she works at Valencia right now. She's like, uh, she's working in the studio and stuff. So she recorded a song that I wrote 
Um, we might release it under Leaving Haven. I was thinking about doing like a solo thing, but at the same time, there's going to be more ears listening to it if we put it under Leaving Haven. So I'm definitely kind of still determining what I'm going to do with that song. And then we did, uh, we just did also an acoustic version of Silver Lining. So we'll be releasing that as well at some point. Well, I'm looking forward to that because I love that song. Thanks, man. Of course. Got to support the homies. Yeah. And speaking of homies, your bandmates are your homies now, but how did you first meet them exactly? So, uh, funny story, you know, I was, I was in a band before this one, too, called What Eyes Can't See. They were more post-hardcore, and I found them off of Craigslist, but things weren't working out. We were kind of not seeing eye to eye. The bassist had left, and the drummer and I were kind of just like, yeah, you know, like, I don't, I don't know if we're, like, in the right place to be doing this right now, or, you know, I think we're, we may have different views on stuff, so... We kind of all went our separate ways, and my mom found them on Craigslist. So she knew that I was, you know, that things weren't working out with my previous band, so she did a little bit of research, and then she found them on Craigslist. I think that's awesome of your mom. Yeah, she, you know, she's she's definitely very supportive of my music. Um, you know, I'm very grateful for that. I'm very grateful for her. I remember seeing your parents at your House of Blues concert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they try and come as, as much as they can, um, unless it's like a, a smaller show or whatever. Like, they're, they're, they try and be there as, as much as they can. They're definitely pretty supportive. But yeah, she, she found them and it was actually around the time when we went on our formal to Tennessee. Oh was, yeah, was, to Nashville. Yeah, 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 to, to Nashville. Yeah, so I, I reached out and um, they told me, you know, do like a, or maybe they said it on their ad, like do a vocal cover of one of our songs. So I did Medicated. It was like terribly recorded. <laughs> it was back in South Florida, but I had my laptop on the desk in my room and I was standing up so you can like kind of just like see up my nostrils as I'm like singing down to this computer for whatever <laughs> reason I don't, I don't know why I decided to do that but I sang the song is actually still on YouTube and I sent it to them and I was mostly in contact with Ben the drummer and he was like yeah man we, we really like what we heard you know just you can try and learn like five of our songs and we'll just jam together and, and see what happens so I learned five of their songs but I was so stupid the night before my rehearsal, I went to, to live with uh, Richie and some other guys. <laughs> oh, God. And, uh, and I was drinking a bunch, so I was obviously dehydrating myself. Living, living the rock star lifestyle before you even entered your band's audition. Yeah, yeah it, was, it, was, it was really stupid, but um, I was singing Paradise City by Guns N' Roses. And if you know Axl Rose, he's got an extremely, extremely large vocal range. He's got oh, like yeah. six octaves. It's like one of the highest in the world. And um, so I was singing Paradise City and my voice blew out. Like I blew out my voice. Um, wow. So I like woke up the next day and my voice was like, you know, I, I definitely couldn't hit things. So I was like, shit, I like, I can't talk for the rest of the day. I just got to be quiet. So I just literally didn't talk the entire day. I just drank like three or four throat coat teas. <laughs> and um, by the time I, and I actually reached out to the drummer. I was like, hey man, like I just want to let you know ahead of time that I was an idiot last night and I basically blew out my voice. Um, I'm just going to not talk all today and see what happens. And he's like, all right, man. So I went to the audition and, you know, by the grace of God, my voice had recuperated by that time and I was able to, to hit everything. And we just talked after, after the audition. They're like, yeah, man, like we, we want you aboard. So, you know, the rest is history. Look at that. Yeah, man. And it just started with a Craigslist ad <laughs> found by your mom. Well, dude, you know, honestly, there's there's still a lot of rock musicians out there. You just have to find them. True. You know? But mm -hmm. you're one of the ones that I'll actually listen to. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, but there's definitely a lot of local bands, a lot of hard rock and metal that we go and support. You, you know, it's just a kind of about going to those shows and, and seeing the people. But there's places like The Haven, you know, House of Blues. House of Blues has like Orlando Rocks where they have different rock bands or metal bands play, which is which is what we did. You may have been there when, when you uh, did the, the photography for me for that. That may have been an Orlando rock show. Maybe. I don't know. I don't think, I don't think we opened up for anybody for that. I think that may have been an Orlando rock show. Okay, yeah, because I think that was just your night specifically. Everybody came out to see you. Yeah, well, no, I mean, it was it was like three other bands, so. Nice. That may have been, I don't know, we, we, we played multiple times with Soul Switch. We played with Blaine the Mono, some other hard rock bands in the area. So I, I don't remember who was playing, what the lineup was that night. Yeah. Awesome. I love that story, Kent. And just that whole thing of you still chasing your dream of being a front man for a band. I just think that's awesome. Thanks, man. Of course. Appreciate it. And speaking of Silver Lining having a message about mental health, one of your other main objectives in life is to also become a therapist. Is this correct? Mm-hmm. Yep. I'm currently a therapist, just not licensed. Okay, my bad. I no, just I just didn't know what kind of moniker to put yourself under in terms of technicality. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess technically you can say I'm not a therapist. I mean, I'm a registered mental health counseling intern, so I'm an intern to become a therapist i guess it's kind of like you, you've watched school of rock right mm -hmm. you're not a teacher you're a temp 
Yeah. <laughs> he's not a temp. He's a substitute teacher, and it, and he's going to get fully certified. Don't yeah. tell the mayor that. Yeah, yeah, basically. So, yeah, I mean, under law, I shouldn't call myself a mental health counselor yet because I'm not licensed. So I'm an intern to become a mental health counselor. So how much uh, longer in your program do you have before you become licensed? Well, I already graduated, but you need 1,500 client contact hours. So basically 1,500 sessions. Um, and then you need 100 supervision hours. And then you also have to take a licensing exam. Got it. Well, still, congratulations on doing all that. In fact, I actually took your undergrad photos. I remember that. Yes, 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 you did. In fact, it's from your shoot that I now learned that always make sure that everyone's tassels on the right side before they graduate. Oh, yeah. I definitely messed up uh, with with that, too. Like, I had, like, the hat too far back or something. It looked kind of weird. You know what? It's all right, because it's like what you said before. If those mistakes were never made, I would never have learned from them. So, therefore, I would have messed up at another time. Yep, makes sense. So... What made you want to get into psychology and become a therapist? I've always been interested in the mind. I think that it's a very fascinating thing knowing about, you know, how the brain operates and why people do the things they do. I've always kind of been inquisitive in, in that regard. So I kind of wanted to go down that path. And at the same time, I was really looking for guidance when I was younger. You know, I went to therapists growing up for the things that I went through as an adolescent and I found it very helpful for me and being able to kind of empower myself and, and feel like I, I can't accomplish the things that I want in my life. And so I, you know, I want to return that, that favor to others. I think that's awesome. Actually, if it wasn't for me mentioning that I needed to go to a therapist when I was younger, I don't think I would have been fully diagnosed with Asperger's, Gotcha. which yeah. was something huge in my life. Yeah, man, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's unfortunate that there's still a, you know, a, a bit of a stigma related to, to going to therapy, you know, you're kind of seen as crazy or whatever, but to take into consideration, I mean, like I see people from all walks of life. I've seen firefighters, football players, everything. So, you know, you don't have to just be some specific person or you're by any means crazy. I mean, it's people that come in just to kind of check up and you know, want to vent about stuff or want help with their relationships or helping them find their life purpose in life. You know, it's, it's not always something major. And even if it is, I mean, you should be getting help if, if that's what you need, you know, and it's it's extremely cathartic and it's it's very healing for people. Especially when you can get on progress with somewhere because what I've noticed about therapists, or at least the ones that I've been to, is that they somehow word things in a way that you kind of not solve your own problems, but they make you think in a way where it's like, How can you help yourself? Because we know you have it in you. It's just we just need to tap into it. Correct. Helping people, yeah, like I've said before, like empower them, make them realize that they have choice in these situations or they have the ability to change their circumstances in a lot of ways. So, you know, it's, it's, it's some of that, you know, every therapist is, is different. Every therapist has their own kind of modality or their perspective or philosophy on life that they tend to bring into to counseling. And that's what's so great about counseling, too, is it's actually very creative as opposed to, I mean, you wouldn't... T you know, necessarily think of therapy as very creative, but it really is because you're seeing different people every day with different problems and, you know, coming in and coming up with different types of ways to help them with those problems. It's not a one size fits all. It's not a one size fits all. You know, for one person, they may do a lot better with someone's a lot more non-directive, who's a lot more person centered. So kind of being a little bit more laid back in that regard as the therapist and allowing the, the client to kind of guide more so than those other therapists. Like myself is a little bit more directive, being a little bit more confrontational when needed, not just to, you know, to be rude or anything like that, but to help kind of challenge clients' beliefs and, and thoughts about certain things that are inhibiting them from... It's kind of like tough love. Growth. Yeah, exactly. So there's a lot of different modalities out there or theories that people go by. Um, and yeah, it's not one size fits all. So, you know, some people that take from different types of therapy, so they're a little bit more eclectic. So they do something from, you know... Uh, a technique from from this modality than a technique from this modality and so it's a very creative process and i really enjoy it would you say that you've already found that you've already honed in on your modality of therapy i would say so i mean i'm, I'm still always growing you know like i haven't been doing therapy for very long you know i started back at ucf when i was in grad school i was gonna say weren't you like a bit of an in-house therapist for zbt as well <laughs> yeah i was more of just like a brotherhood i forgot what the what was it uh, brotherhood wellness or something like Men that i do remember you were like the mental health chair or something like that yeah it was more like brother wellness so like if anybody wanted to kind of talk to me about stuff and just kind of have someone to bounce ideas off of i, w I was there for them i wouldn't really consider
consider it therapy because I wasn't trained or anything like that. But um, once I really, I really got into it in uh, the beginning of 2019, that's when I worked at the CCRC on campus. So the Community Counseling and Research Center. So people from all over. I actually think I took a few sessions there. To be honest, I did that one summer. So there's CAPS. Which that's is a what, community. That, uh, that's or, the one I used. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I forgot what it stands for, but that's like the actual one for students. And the CCRC is for anybody in the Orlando area. And the people who are given the counseling are students who are currently in their master's program. Oh, okay. Actually, that's really good to know. In fact, that was actually a pretty good bit of tidbit that if anybody watches this and they're from the Central Florida area, they now have another resource to go to in order to better their mental health. So yeah. The thanks for mentioning that. Absolutely. It's a community counseling and research center at UCF. I think it's really close to a garage A. But anyway, yeah, so it was kind of... Go ahead. I was going to say, that's by the bus loops, if I'm not Yeah, yeah, so it's like right next to the bus loops. Okay, perfect. So if you are in the Central Florida area or at UCS specifically, Kent just pointed you in the right direction. Yeah, so, you know, I was there for a year, kind of doing some counseling there, and then... Uh, I forgot where were we going with this. What where was what were we talking about before? Well, you were like how kind of an in-house therapist and how you kind of just started with grad school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I definitely, I definitely honed in more on my theoretical orientation, as they would call it, more during internship, which I started at the beginning of t- 2020. Um, before obviously with COVID and everything, but I was there for about three months, and then I came back after summer, and I was I was there for the rest of. Uh, of the I, year. Actually, I actually have a question. I assume you've had to deal with patients during COVID, correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That must have been very difficult for you, especially as someone who's trying to become a therapist. Well, I mean, it's just, you know, with the pandemic, I mean, there's a lot of new issues that arise. I mean, there's still, you know, clients that I see that are, are dealing with those types of things, you know, and kind of helping people get back to some sense of normalcy. But yeah, you know, uh, I definitely take more of a little bit more of a directive approach. I do more CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy. So that's definitely like my main theory, theoretical orientation. I also do more solution focused therapy. So kind of. So I have a question. I'm sure there are a lot of people who don't know exactly what CBT is. So if you could, do you have any like specific definition? Yeah. So, I mean, it's basically, it actually is rooted back in stoicism, the philosophy, uh, you know, stoic philosophy, or it's really not the events as much as it's the way that we perceive the events that has more of the impact. So it's, you know, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, our cognitions affect our behaviors. So it's our thoughts dictate our feelings, which dictate our behaviors. So if we're able to change the maybe irrational thinking or unhelpful thinking that we have, um, that can subsequently change our internal state, which will change our behaviors. Interesting. So like, for instance, if you're on the sidewalk or you're at school and we're still at UCF and, you know, you were having a really good day and, you know, you just decide to smile at someone and then they look at you and they're like, oh, what the hell are you looking at? And they keep on going, right? Well, I mean, that's not a pleasant experience, right? But there's different ways that we can perceive that, right? You can take that personally and be like, you know, what did I do wrong? Why do they look at me that way? Dang, don't ever do something stupid like that again, you know, just... Don't ever look at anybody like that again. That was really stupid for you to smile at some stranger, right? And how that's going to make you feel? I mean, you're not, you're going to feel like crap, right? You're going to feel probably pretty self-conscious, maybe even sad, anxious, whatever, right? And then maybe moving forward now, you kind of just keep your head looking down. You don't say hi to any other strangers because anybody knew because you took that one situation personally. But what if we could see that in a different way? You know, what if that person just got fired from their job or they just found out that their spouse of five years has been cheating on them or, you know, someone in their family, you know, or, or yeah, or maybe a family member just died and they're taking it out on the first person that they just saw. Right. So if we can see it, well, I don't think I did anything wrong by smiling at someone You know, maybe they're just having a bad day. I wish them the best. That's going to make you feel very different internally, right? You're not going to necessarily feel sad about it or you know, self-conscious or you don't, worried. There's no guilt associated because there's nothing that you did wrong. It's just how the world kind of played out at that point in time. Correct. And then moving forward, right, the, the behavior is going to be very different. You're probably still going to say hi to new people. You're not going to, you know, look down and avoid everybody, right? But it mm-hmm. was the way that we perceive those events in the beginning that play a large role in, you know, the outcomes that follow thereafter. So it's helping people see other perspectives or see where they're maybe having unhelpful thinking that is causing them to stay stuck. Wow. And that kind of goes back to your belief that we're kind of lacking empathy. So I think CBT kind of feeding back into bringing that back into people's consciousness. Yeah. Or seeing different perspectives to things, right? Mm -hmm. Seeing that there's more out there than, than what we're just seeing. 
potentially. Okay. Weird question. I know you're into rock music, but have you ever heard of the Dave Matthews Band? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So they have this one song called Funny the Way It Is, and mm -hmm. it's kind of a song that talks about how problems are relative. And for so example, one lyric of the song goes, one kid's starving and another's eating out. Mm -hmm. And so, and they say funny the way it is. Well, you know, that's kind of the where the song is going, but it's kind of going back to what you're saying in terms of empathy, seeing things in other people's shoes. And maybe if we were to do that, maybe there, we could get to some inkling of world peace because yeah. honestly, I'm kind of shitty with my theory of world peace will never be achieved until all of humanity is gone. Yeah, well, I mean, I totally agree with the whole, you know, if we can empathize, that can definitely change things for the better. With 7 billion plus people, you can't change everybody. No, no, absolutely not. It's more of just a start of helping, you know, maybe ch change the way in which we're looking at things currently, you know. Again, it doesn't mean you have to agree with the other person's perspective, but at least being able to see their their point of view and maybe to why they're coming to that belief or, you know, have their thoughts or views on those specific things. At least it's like, okay, well, I may disagree, but I can understand where you're coming from. Correct. And you don't have to go out of your way to agree with them to the point where it physically changes your life. People are entitled to their own lives and their own opinions. It's just, you just have to know that there are other people out there and that maybe your worldview is not commonly shared with everyone. Correct. And so it's like, if we can live in that kind of way where it's like more understanding that there's going to be people with different views than ours and we're not going to, it's not our place to change theirs and likely we're not going to, then, you know, I think that that can definitely change things for the better. Do you like stoicism? Yeah, for sure. Have you ever heard of Ryan Holiday? I have not heard of him, no. So I actually did some research into stoicism myself because I was going through a rough patch in my life. Mm -hmm. and I needed some kind of guidance. And so I came across stoicism because I was blaming a lot of things on other people. Mm -hmm. And I realized that no matter what I was doing, I was wondering why nothing was working. And then I found stoicism. And then I have read a few books by this guy, Ryan Holiday, who was kind of one of the modern main guys for stoicism. Mm -hmm. And I read his books. One book kind of changed my life forever. It's called Ego is the Enemy. I read it and reflected and realized I was being a brat. And so I realized that once I started to... um hunker down and realize that everything that I did was my fault and going back to the realization that I don't have to always be a person that sucks that I can redeem myself those books changed my life for the way better and I couldn't be any more grateful for them existing that's awesome man yeah I definitely have to check that out but uh you know stoicism can be very very helpful you know it's not the idea of like just having no emotions and look brawn all the time correct it's really not like that it's more about coming to a place of is there a different way that I can see this perspective, you know, or see this situation that may be able to help me move past this? Or it even comes a lot to acceptance in terms of emotions that arise. It's not, oh, I can't feel this. I can't feel anger. Or I can't feel, you know, anxiety or things like that. But being able to understand that there is some sense of, I mean, it's normal to feel these emotions, to not resist them, but to use them or allow them to kind of go through your body so they can kind of pass through and, and run their course and then kind of continue on. Um, there's a lot of things that you can take from it. Also, understanding that I think this may have been Marcus Aurelius, but he was saying anytime, I'm paraphrasing here, but he's saying <laughs> anytime that you, or anytime that you're thinking about something that is out of your control is a waste of time on this life on earth. So if you're focusing on other people's opinions or things that are going on in the world that you have no ability to change, right? Um, people's behaviors or whatever, like you're, you're wasting your time. Right, so coming to an acceptance of that realization that we can't control the people's behaviors, and there's a lot of things that are out of our control. There's absolutely, and the only things that we can control are our own behaviors and those types of things. Yeah. And with stoicism, going back to what you're saying, it's not a lack of emotions. In fact, I'm pretty sure that's being psychopathic if you mm -hmm. can't really show emotions. But it's just the fact that when people think stoicism, they think these guys who have no emotions and they are the manliest of men. But the thing is that it's not exactly them being not fearful. It's just that whatever situation comes their way, whether it's good or bad, they're going to do whatever it takes to adapt the situation and then continue living a normal life or as best of a mm -hmm. life as they possibly can. Correct. And that again goes back to, to CBT or CBT comes from is the perspective change, right? Rather than resisting things or like, you know, we talk about amor fati or I forgot how you pronounce it, but like that love, is it. love of love of fate, right? Which is another thing is you know, being able to accept what, what comes our way via things that are out of our control. Like, for instance, you know, getting fired from our jobs because of COVID or whatever. Rather than resisting it, although it sucks, is not, you know, staying stuck there and dwelling, right? Is, is understanding it, it, it sucks, but I'm going to be able to get through this. And what can I do moving forward to not allow this situation to make me crumble? 
There's actually one historical example that's one of my favorites of a guy who was stoked through and through and there was a low point where his own country wanted to kill him but then he now is known as the martial lord of loyalty. He's a Korean admiral by the name of Admiral Yi Sun Sin. He essentially saved Korea from the Japanese, well with a lot of help from China, but essentially he did it, was undefeated in battle, and multiple times because the Korean courts were super corrupt, they kind of noticed that he was really popular and they were not okay with that. And even mm-hmm. at one point, they tried to have him executed. But the thing is that the main leader, I don't know if he was specifically the king, but he was like the main prime minister of Korea, was like his buddy. So he convinced them to not kill him. And so by not doing that, he was sent to the lowest rank in the military and, you know, was just sent to some random outpost. But then when the Japanese came back and destroyed the fleet that he had built, which defeated the Japanese, he was recalled again and he saved the country one last time before dying in his final battle. Wow. And so after being treated like crap so many times, he still did what was right or what was needed to save the country. And so he is now known as one of South Korea's national heroes of all time. That's awesome, man. Yeah, that's that's a great story. It is. It's pretty metal if you think about it. It is super metal. Dude sound like a badass. He was a total badass. Yeah. Yep. Of course, metal historical figures you never heard of until now. No, dude. I never heard of that guy. So if anything, cheers. Cheers. Prost. Prost. Yeah, Kent brought this beer called Franziskana. Franziskana Weissbier. I like it. I think that's how you pronounce it. Weissbier, white beer. I don't know how to pronounce the first. I think it's Franziskana. It looks correct. I've actually been taking German lessons on my Duolingo app. Same. Nice. Yeah. What how, do you th- how much have you learned so far? I have the premium edition, so like, mm-hmm. I, so for some odd reason, I unlocked one section and like five other units opened up. So I've been kind of just chipping it away, away at it, but mm-hmm. it's very cool. It kind of boring to see how there are a lot of similarities between German and English. There is a lot. Um, the the weirdest thing is like a sentence structure. That's what's very very hard to kind of wrap your head around. You know, like it's changing kind of things all over the place. Like Korean's even worse. I bet. I bet. But yeah, I mean, there's definitely certain things that are similar, like Daman, right? The mm-hmm. man, or the apple, the apple, right? But then there's other things that are super different. You know, like an airplane is Flugzeug. Or an ambulance is Krankenwagen. Like, or, crank is sick in yeah, German. Yeah, Krank. Yeah, so it's, there's definitely some similarities. I think, I forgot where I heard this from. Maybe my grandmother told me this. Um, but in America, it was like one vote off from us being a, a German speaking country i wouldn't be surprised because i know a lot of uh, northern states especially northern midwest states they speak a lot of german mm-hmm. actually from the white side my jewish side my great-grandmother immigrated from germany mm. in the mid-1930s but that's because she was jewish and so let's just put it this way they got out just in time yeah well, it's a great thing that they did man that's it's terrible what was going on back yeah. then but actually speaking of metal bands one of my favorite metal bands or i think they're considered new metal but disturbed yeah their, their lead singer david dryman is a super jew in yeah. fact for the longest time he would not get a tattoo because it is against jewish custom to mm-hmm. quote unquote defile the body that god gave you but you know mm-hmm. i mean granted i think holocaust victims got away with that but that's because it was for a very specific reason but then david dryman um he wrote that song never again which it was all about the Holocaust. Mm-hmm. Did he end up getting a tattoo? Or I no? think so, because he eventually was like, you know, what are the chances of me being buried in Israel with my ancestors? Yeah, I got you. I mean, I did. That guy is an amazing musician. He really is. He really is. I mean, what, what's your favorite album by them? Inside the Fire. Okay. I'd have to go with The uh, the Sickness. Okay, fair. Like earlier. I would say um, 10,000 Fists was also a pretty good album. That was a great, yeah. yeah. DFI <laughs> and uh, Stricken. Amazing. Yep. And everyone's first exposure to Stricken, I think, was Guitar Hero 2. Oh, yeah, for sure. Was it was it 2 or was it 3? I think it was 2, actually. Maybe 2, yeah. Do you remember the Guitar Hero series? Oh, yeah. That's kind of like when rock was kind of coming back-ish because everyone was, like, learning, you know, mostly Metallica stuff. Everybody that I knew that listened to hip-hop, the only rock songs they had on their iPods at the time, <laughs> iPods, were songs from Guitar Heroes 2 and 3. Yeah, or Linkin Park, you know, everybody was listening to, anybody who listened to, like, rap, if they were listening to, to rock, it was probably Linkin Park, because it had a lot of rap elements with Mike Shinoda and stuff. True, and also they did do that collab with Jay-Z. Yeah, that, that too. Man, I still remember the day that I heard that Chester Bennington died. That was, that was a dark day, man. I'm pretty sure a lot of offices played Linkin Park in honor, because I remember AK, his office played entirely Linkin Park that day. Wow. Yeah, Linkin Park, their monumental influence 
on music today and and transformers soundtrack literally them and everybody from our era especially like when we went to middle school when megan fox came out sure she was like the bomb show but then everyone remembered lincoln park's music mm-hmm. yeah what's that song um what i've done no no uh which is like a, he has like a, a super long scream given up yeah that's that's insane that he's able to do that but uh I don't know what kind of lung capacity he had, but it was like super... Insane, insane lung capacity. Insane, like superhuman. Like, I tried to sing in the car by myself, but I'm like, yeah, I'm not even going to butcher this because (laughs) it's kind of a... Not a nephew to him, but it's kind of like, yeah, I'll just stay in my corner. (laughs) Yeah, um, Meteora was an amazing album. I remember the first time I heard Linkin Park was, you know, back in uh, elementary days. You know, you could kind of like go on your computers for a little while and like play games on there or do whatever. They kind of give you some time to to play on it and my buddy put on somewhere i belong like on the computer this is back in like 2003 so this is right when meteor came out and i was like what is this this is amazing was this on youtube or like limewire or something like that i don't remember i don't even know youtube was around in 2003 i don't remember um you're right i think it was like 2005 yeah it may have been it was probably some other website i mean it was 2003 so i was i was nine when I first heard Linkin Park, and I was like, wow, this is incredible. Um, Do you think Chester Bennington kind of had some influence as you as an artist? Uh, I, I would say so, yeah. I mean, I haven't, like, you know, I wouldn't say that, like, I consciously thought about it, but I've heard from a few people that we have some similarities. I don't know. I don't necessarily hear it, but, you know, I listened to a lot of Linkin Park growing up, so I would say probably uh, subconsciously, it's, it's definitely had, he's definitely had an influence Man, just that statement you said, you're so humble, Kent. I hear similarities, to be honest with you. But you know what? You can think the way you do, but, you know, we we both think you sound awesome. So. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. I mean, there's definitely other bands that I I definitely take more major influence on, like Silverstein, The Used, Finch, um, Get Scared, Bullet for My Valentine, Too Close to Touch, Ghost Atlas, Seosin, wow. things like that. You know, those are the bands that I listen to a lot. So, like, when I'm writing stuff, I, I tend to take stuff from there. Awesome. Sounds like great influences. It's always great to hear about your inspirations and where your roots come from. All great stuff that we're talking about. And we're going to continue this conversation in my favorite part of any Big DK Energy episode, the bonus question round. Ten right, questions that I came up with that you do not know about but are appropriate, so therefore you will be able to stay in your residency. All right. So, so that, be- <laughs> that being said, are you ready, Kent? I'm ready, man. Awesome. So question number one. Dio has risen from hell in a cloud of bats and has chosen you as the frontman for the band to bring back rock from the literal and figurative grave. Which deceased band members do you resurrect for this epic band? Chuck Schuldiner from Death. He'd be the guitarist for sure. Um, lead or rhythm? Lead, lead for sure. Who else? Uh, I would say maybe Eddie Van Halen. Uh, rest in peace for, for him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it'd be two very different guitarists, but that, and I think, I think it'd be cool. Who else? You got a bassist and a drummer. Who's the guy from Slipknot? What was his, what was the bassist name from Slipknot? He was... Ooh, actually, I don't know. These, you, these are hard questions. I don't know. I don't you, know who I would... You can look him up real quick if you wanted to. Okay, so the guy's name is Paul Gray. Okay, Paul Gray. So I would end up going with Paul Gray, and then drummer-wise, who's like a really amazing metal drummer that passed away? The Rev? Yeah, dude, what? Yeah, The Rev. I would totally pick The Rev. Awesome. 100%. Totally pick The Rev. Awesome. Great lineup. Number two. What are three little-known facts about you? Three little-known facts about me. I'm half Puerto Rican, so a lot of people... Gay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't, don't, don't notice that, but uh, yeah, my mom's from, from Puerto Rico, and so, I mean, when my hair grows out, it's, it's pretty curly, so... Oh, and also another fun fact... Kent here was also a child actor. In fact, you will probably see him in a show that most of you know, and it's called Burn Notice. Yeah, I was on the uh, I was on the pilot episode, so that was recorded back in December two thousand six, and then it was I remember it, it was aired in like June or July two thousand seven. So that oh, wait, was a the, long time ago. Wait, these were your answers. I'm sorry, but yeah, yeah. So so those, and then another fun fact. I just got back into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Oh, man, that's kick-ass, both literally and figuratively. Yeah, so um, I was in it for about two and a half, three years. So I did it for a year under Pablo Popovich back in South Florida when I was like 13, 12 to 13. I didn't really stick with it at the time. And then I got back into it when I was 16 and ended 
almost by, like right before my 19th birthday because my teacher had moved back up to Maryland. So it's just kind of been in the back burner for the past almost 10 years now. Well, oh, nine, wow. nine years. So I've just really wanted to get back into it. So I just signed back up with uh, Gracie Baja in uh, uh, North Orlando off of Mills Ave. So super excited to uh, continue that journey. And the best part is you'll be able to help security if any fans get too uppity. <laughs> Hopefully it never has to get to that point, but uh, I love it. Excellent. Awesome. Those are three very cool facts, actually. So moving on to number three. What's the best piece of advice you received in terms of maintaining mental health? Well, I think just part of it is just the idea that, especially as as counselors, that we need to be engaging in self-care. You know, making sure that outside of counseling others that we're doing everything that we can to be taking care of ourselves, whether that's also going to a therapist. I think that's that's a big thing is kind of removing the stigma. There's a lot of people even in the field who feel weird about going to therapy. I'm like, but really, but yeah, yeah. because again, it's it shows more of the societal stigma of going to counseling, even if you were going to be a therapist. <laughs> so it's kind of like normalizing that, um, that they did consistently throughout our program when I was in my master's and just doing the little things every day to kind of decompress. So whether that's reading a book or that's going to the gym or that's, you know, doing a martial art or playing an instrument is making sure that you're like incorporating that every day into your life. Even just having a cup of tea or watching a show, just Something that allows you to kind of decompress at the end of the day to make sure that your mental health is in check and that you aren't burning yourself out. That's really yeah. great advice, actually. Because we, we, we unfortunately live, I mean, there's, there's a lot of hustle culture. And, you know, what comes with that, there can be, you know, a detriment to your mental health. It's like you always have to keep on going, going, going. Any type of break just makes you weak. Or unmotivated, uh, you know, unmotivated. And that's definitely a, an unhelpful way of thinking. You know, we all need to rest. I mean, when you think about an athlete, for instance, right, they're not going to perform to their 100% capacity if they're constantly training and not taking any rest. You know, rest is just as important as the training. So if you want to perform to your full capabilities, you need to be able to take time off and rest. And I think that's, you know, where that self care comes in and being able to relax and allowing yourself to decompress and chill out for a while before kind of going back into things so you can kind of, you know, restart. Fantastic advice. And even though it's always said, it's always, it's mostly unheeded, Mm -hmm. which is the sad part. But number four, you're grabbing a brew with three of the most influential figures in your life that are not friends or family. Who are they? Definitely be Matt Hafey from Trivium. He's, uh, he's definitely someone I'm, I'm super influenced by with music and stuff like that from, from Trivium. Um, who else? Because these also be people that have passed away. Okay. Then I'd probably go with Marcus Aurelius. Nice. Yep, to understand kind of his, his philosophy a little bit deeper. Definitely, again, as I said before, Chuck Schuld- Schuldner from, from Death, who passed away back in 2001. Rest in peace. Mm-hmm. I, was actually, peace. I was just at his tribute show uh, last week, and it was amazing. Um, oh, that's awesome. And fourth, it'd probably be Joe Rogan. Nice. Yeah, Joe Rogan or Elon Musk, one of those two. <laughs> one of those successful potheads. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, those guys are awesome. I'd love to have a beer with them. So yeah, great choices. Number five, describe a dream tour for leaving Haven. A dream tour for leaving Haven. For me, it would be any place in Europe. I would love to do a European tour at some point. That's still... Uh, Where in Europe? Uh, definitely Germany. Um, I'd like to, to go to France as well, uh, Norway, Poland. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so kind of some of those Western European, I mean also Eastern European, Western European, Scandinavian, mm-hmm. um, British Isles. Anywhere there, I'd love to, uh, to kind of visit. Who would be in the lineup? Yeah, who's opening for you? Opening for us? I mean, we'd be opening for someone else. No, no, no. Leaving Haven is the main band. People uh, are opening for you. Oh, man, dude. Um, I would say Funeral for a Friend. They're uh, an emo post-hardcore band from the early 2000s. Who else? Either Circa Survive or Seosin. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, them too. I mean, I, I love those bands so much. So Number six, what is your dream vacation and itinerary? I think, again, that would just go back to traveling all around Europe, like kind of just doing like a backpack all over Europe. What? I think specific places, I really want to visit Poland. I really want to visit Norway. I really want to visit France, just everything I was talking about in the in the tour. But doing lots of hiking, going to Germany again, um, going to Oktoberfest, that's definitely one thing on my bucket list that I have to go off, so that would definitely be part of my dream vacation. I'm wearing lederhosen at Oktoberfest 
in in Munich. Going to Norway and, and visiting a lot of the fjords and stuff like that. And yeah, I have some friends who are who are from there as well. So kind of seeing them and seeing what the day to day life is there. Poland, I really want to check out. Like, so they actually have some really good mead there. I don't know if you're really into to mead, the type of drink. I'm not, but I, I'm aware of what it is. Isn't it like beer mixed with honey? So it's actually just a uh, honey wine. So it's like equal parts water, equal parts honey. Well, I mean, it's it's the oldest alcoholic drink in the world. Oh, 100%. So. They were drinking this shit back in the medieval times. Yeah. So, I mean, that probably also ties why. Fire back. tuck. Yeah. So probably ties back into uh, wanting to go to Norway because they were really big mead drinkers as well as in, in Eastern Europe. So Poland, um, they have really good good meads there. So kind of just going to the, like different meaderies in the area and that would definitely be a, a dream tr- a dream shirt for me as well. It sounds awesome. And actually, fun fact about alcoholic drinks back in the ancient days, it was actually much safer to drink than water. Really? Because because with some stagnant pools of water, it would easily give diseases or make a lot of people sick. So yeah. with the alcohol and the fermentation, it kind of kills those cells that would affect the gut. I mean, granted, of course, they'd be hammered all the time, but weirdly enough, it was safer to drink. Yeah, and with the Vikings and stuff, they were drinking mead and, and taking shrooms and stuff in battle and stuff, which is crazy. The berserk, that's how the berserkers came that's to how, be. Yeah, that's what I was just about to bring up. But um, it's crazy to think about, too, like, how did they, like, collect this honey? Were they just getting stung by bees the entire time trying to collect this <laughs> stuff? Like, you think they would go with something a little easier, like, I don't know, you know, grapes and stuff, which they eventually did, right? But it's funny that they went to that to that first, which I'm glad they did because mead is, is delicious. Okay, well, I guess I'm going to have to try some then. So number seven. You're sitting front row at an MMA main event. Who are you sitting with? Can be friends, family, or celebrities. And who is fighting? Okay. Um, sitting with would definitely be Dustin Poirier. He's my favorite MMA fighter. Um, if he's not fighting, he would be sitting next to me. As well as, who else? Frank Mir. He's another one of my favorite MMA fighters. And who else? Who would be someone else that I would really want? Juliana Pena, she beat Amanda Nunes the other day. That's who it was, yeah, okay. Yeah. It's really an awesome story because everybody kind of under underestimated her. I definitely like like the underdogs and stuff like that. So. Everyone loves a good underdog story. Yeah, if I was watching someone fight, I would really like to see uh, the wife of Dustin Poirier and the wife of Conor McGregor to see what would happen. Because, <laughs> you know, Conor and Dustin, they hate each other. And so I wonder what the wives think. <laughs> about one another because they're kind of just more behind the scenes they don't really talk trash to one another more to you know julie poirier was kind of she flicked off conor mcgregor like in their last fight when he was like talking a bunch of crap about him and his family which wasn't cool but uh i'd, I'd probably like to watch that or i'd like to watch hasbala and abdu <laughs> you know <laughs> i'm still waiting for that fight to happen i think it'd be, I think it'd be hilarious so <laughs> Oh man, I'd love to see that fight. Let's hope that actually becomes a reality because I think people would pay top dollar to watch that. I would absolutely pay top dollar to watch that. Speaking of paying top dollar, number eight, you just played an amazing sold out show that people pay top dollar for. Mm -hmm. What are you and the band doing for the after party and who are other musicians that are with you? That's a good question. I've, I've really wanted to play the Chain Reaction. It's in California, I believe. Um, So a lot of bands have, have played there. I'd love to play there and maybe just go to like a, maybe at like one of the bandmates houses. I mean, if we were obviously living out there mm-hmm. or just going to like a penthouse and having like a, a rager up there and just have a bunch of people. If I could invite anybody, it'd be just from probably some of like those, those main bands um, that I'm really influenced by. So like Anthony Green from Circus Revive and Sayosin, Cove Reber, who used to be in Sayosin, uh, Matt Heafy from Trivium. Who else? Uh, Shane Told from Silverstein. That'd be an awesome, awesome guy to have along as well. We're out of question, but what's the name of the guy who's the singer for Papa Roach? That's uh, Jacoby Shaddix. Yeah, he'd be really cool to be to be there as well. Hulk Hogan. I would like to be there. <laughs> yeah, totally other side, but Hulk Hogan, uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin. Now I'm like going to like Uh-oh, you bet, WWE. You bet, but, I was about to say, you better bring extra beers for him. Yeah, John Cena, but nobody would see him. So. <laughs> Yeah, I'd have, I'd have a bunch of people there, man. Just like some of the wild people. It sounds like an awesome party. Yeah. Hell, if that ever happens, please invite me. I would. I would 100%. <laughs> You're the man, Kent. You're Number, the man, Danny K. <laughs> I appreciate it. Number nine, what is one far-fetched goal you have in life? I mean, making it in music. Uh, that's definitely my number one goal. You know, a lot of people would say it's 
you know, far-fetched because obviously the music market is extremely saturated. But just because it's a far-fetched goal doesn't mean I'm not going to go after it and do everything that I can to make that a reality. Steps for you, brother. Yeah, so, you know, from <laughs> kind of what I think it was Will Smith that said, it's like doing what's realistic is the most commonly traveled road to mediocrity. So being realistic and being like, well, this isn't going to work out, so I'm not going to give it my all effort and see what happens is just, that doesn't work for me. I prefer to be on my deathbed and be like, well, you know, even if I didn't make it, I did everything that I could to make that a reality. And if it didn't happen, I can at least, you know, pat myself on the back and said that I tried rather than wondering, you know, what if, you know, giving it my all, if, if things would have been different. I freaking love that, dude. Thanks, man. And kind of, it kind of does tie into number 10, which is the question that I ask everybody. What is your best, most recent accomplishment? I would probably say um, either it was graduating from my master's or much more recently, as we talked about earlier, was doing my first acoustic song. You know, I never really thought that that was really in the cards for me, you know, because I never really write acoustic stuff. Um, I don't even play my acoustic guitar that much, but I kind of just gave it my all. And, you know, I wrote it from start to finish and it's kind of, you know, helped improve my confidence in being able to do something like that moving forward. And so, you know, now I don't have, you know, that doubt of, eh, you know, I, I couldn't write an acoustic song or I shouldn't, I shouldn't go after that. So in the future, if I have something, some idea that I would like to make into an acoustic song, I think it's helped build my confidence in being able to do that moving forward. Man, all these ansoms and even this whole episode in general was just awesome, Kent. So Thanks, thank you for the awesome answers. And listen, I love speaking with you, but unfortunately we are at the end of the show. And so listen, I know you're busy getting those hours and I know you're working on music all the time but I want to say I'm really appreciative that you took some time and came on the show today dude I'm really appreciative of it too thank you so much for having me Danny of course so the reason why I brought you on the show Kent is because like I said and as we joke around you're one of the last bastions of rock here in Orlando and unfortunately I've had the talk with a lot of my friends that rock is a dying art art form but it's just that you're still so passionate about it that like you even just said in your most far-fetched goal answer, you're doing whatever you can to make it in music and there's going to be nothing stopping you. And that is very commendable and very admirable. And also the fact that you kind of inspire some people to go after their musical dreams. You also help out people mentally health-wise, which during this pandemic is critical. And so it is for those two reasons that I think you, Kent Lefebvre, have big DK energy. Thank you so much, man. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. And so that all being said and done, we're going to put his social media links in the descriptions as well as links to all of his band's info. And is there anything else you'd like to say or promote before we head off? If you uh, you like what you heard, check us check my band out on, uh, like I said, Spotify, music, you know, Apple Music, all that kind of stuff. Um, and let's keep uh, rock and roll alive. And thank you guys so much for tuning in. Awesome. Well, with that all being said and done, I am Danny Kay from the Big DK Energy Podcast, and we're signing off.